the crucifixion of Christ, the most iconic event in the Christian faith. For centuries, people believed that his body was wrapped in a linen cloth, the Shroud of Turin. And imprinted on the fabric was the actual face of Christ. Here's something that proves Jesus walked and talked among us. People venerate the shroud as a tantalizing physical link to the crucifixion, but is it real? In 1988... We knew that it wouldn't be 2,000 years old after five minutes. Now, one of the first scientists to analyze the relic has uncovered startling new evidence. In an interview given just before he died... I think I can come very close to proving that it was used to bury the historic Jesus. On the 8th of October, 1978, in the Italian city of Turin, an unprecedented event took place. For the first time, the church allowed scientists to examine the Shroud of Turin, one of the most mysterious objects in the Western world. For 120 hours, the Shroud of Turin research project ran thousands of tests on this 14-foot piece of linen, believed by many to be the sacred burial shroud of Jesus Christ. We opened up Pandora's box and created a whole new group of questions. One of the leading members of the team was Ray Rogers, a highly respected chemist from the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Rogers was a man of science, but he was intrigued by the shroud. It harbored great mysteries that he wanted to solve. I don't believe in miracles that defy the laws of nature. If the shroud is real, this fragile piece of cloth has survived 2,000 years. According to the Gospels, Jesus was crucified by the Romans. His body was taken down from the cross and wrapped in a shroud. Many believe that after Christ's resurrection, the shroud was saved. But the story of this cloth is as mysterious as the life of the person it portrays. For centuries, the shroud vanished. In the 14th century, a shroud appeared in the French town of Lyrie. People claimed it was Christ's. It was a time of famine and plague in Europe. Fragments of Christ's crown of thorns and slivers of wood from his cross were a focus for hopes and prayers. This is a time when people couldn't look to the government, they couldn't look to a vaccine, they couldn't look to the army, they couldn't look to anything to protect them except Jesus, except the saints. There were many different shrouds, all claimed to be Christ's, but the most seductive was the shroud at Leary. It was amazingly detailed, with a faint image of a man, and it captured the imagination of all who saw it. There's an emotional attachment to the Shroud of Turin that very few other objects have, but the Shroud is so powerful in the image that it bears and the significance of that image to so many people. But the Shroud had its share of misfortune. Fire nearly destroyed it in 1532, and water stained the image. Nuns repaired the shroud and attached a protective backing cloth. In 1578, the shroud moved to its current resting place in northern Italy. For the next four centuries, it was kept in Turin and occasionally displayed to the faithful. But few outside Italy knew of the shroud or had seen the faint image of Christ. It was only in 1898 
that the world finally became aware of the incredible image on the shroud. Italian Seconda Pier took the first photograph. When it was published, the shroud became world famous. When Secundo Pia makes this photograph, he almost dropped the plate. It scared him because he said, my God, I was looking into the face of the Lord. That's when he realized that the image on the cloth is a negative. The lights and darks are reversed from what we're used to seeing. For the first time, people could clearly see the body on the shroud as a positive image. The photograph displayed details that were invisible to the naked eye. It triggered an uproar. He's immediately accused of fraud, immediately accused of cheating, lying, and manipulating this. It's a fake. And it wasn't until 1931 when Giuseppe Henriet is allowed to photograph the shroud for the second time. Gets the same results, of course. The world of science suddenly looks at the shroud and says, well, wait a minute, maybe we should look at this closer. Scientists couldn't get access to the sacred relic, but the photographs were now in the public domain. And as the 20th century progressed, new technology was set to reveal even more detailed images of the face in astonishing 3D. By the 1970s, the Turin Shroud was world famous. Many believed it was the burial shroud of Jesus, and yet scientists hadn't been able to examine it. But advances in photographic analysis were starting to uncover incredible clues hidden in the image itself. One breakthrough was made using a remarkable new imaging device. The VP8 was originally designed to analyze aerial photographs. It converts the light and dark on a traditional two-dimensional image to create a brightness map displayed on a 3D grid. Scientists wondered if it could be used to shed new light on the shroud. Engineer Peter Schumacher helped develop the VP8. Nobody in our company had ever even heard of the Shroud of Turin, let alone seen pictures or wanted to look at image analysis of the Shroud of Turin. When Schumacher placed an ordinary photograph under the machine, it displayed levels of brightness, but revealed no 3D data. If we look, cheeks really aren't that flat. His eyebrows are not really grooved into his forehead. His nose really doesn't smear all over his face. This is how every photo appeared. The machine couldn't decipher real height and depth to display a true 3D image. But when an image of the shroud was placed under the device, something remarkable happened. All of a sudden, we're seeing contrast that has something to do with height and depth, real distance. The nose has a prominence. The cheeks roll off. The hair has a, a shape to it and is rounded. The uh, whole image has dimension to it. The results suggested that the shroud image could have been created by a real human body. The shroud is a very unique image, the only one of its kind in the whole world. Nothing else like it. Three-dimensional relief, the front and the back of a whole human being. Only one in the world. No other, nowhere, no how, no way. I don't know any way to make it. I've never heard of a way to make it. Just the Shroud of Turin. Armed with these results and keen to find out more, a group of scientists formed the Shroud of Turin Research Project. They lobbied church authorities for permission to analyze the shroud. They said, we should see if we can figure out how this image was formed. The biggest problem has always been access to the cloth itself. Finally, 
in the spring of 1978, despite strong resistance from many in the Vatican, the church agreed. The church took a relatively enlightened view about the shroud. They have a lot of folks who believe, in fact, that it is isn't truly the burial shroud of Christ and don't want anybody meddling with it. The other side of the coin is that if we don't let the scientists look at it, we'll never know what the truth is. For the first time, science had a chance to test the authenticity of one of Christianity's holiest relics. It was a very solemn and moving moment. I have to confess that I was taken with it for a few minutes until I got my wits about me and realized that we had to get down to business. The scientists were not allowed to mark, cut, or damage the shroud in any way. All these tests had to be non-destructive. Most of the local folks really didn't like us messing around with this holy object. We were guarded around the clock by a um, detail of Carbonieri, the Italian state police, replete with machine guns. Uh, who watched uh, not only us, but everyone that came and went. We all had special identification. Apparently, there had been some threats during that time period, and they weren't taking any chances. The team's main goal was to discover how the image got on the shroud. Was it made with paint or another way? They had only five days to conduct their tests and worked round the clock. Barry Schwartz was a photographer on the team. There were spectral analyses done. Sam Pellicori had a spectrophotometer with him that he was using. There were a mosaic of photographs made. It was photographed with ultraviolet fluorescence photography. It was x-rayed using x-ray fluorescence and reflectance imaging. One of the leading scientists involved was Ray Rogers, an acclaimed chemist who led thermochemical research at Los Alamos, where the atomic bomb was developed. The cloth was composed of linen thread, finely woven in a herringbone pattern. Rogers was particularly interested in the areas damaged by the fire in 1532. My primary field is thermochemistry. I, I look at the effects of heat on materials. And here were these scorches on this cloth. I was asked, uh, can I determine whether or not it was painted? There wasn't any painting material there of any kind. And even more important than that to me was that they dumped water on it to put out the fire. Nothing in the image moved with the water. You know, that's rather staggering because at one fell swoop, that pretty much eliminates almost everything that could have been used to paint the, the image. One of the major components of linen is cellulose. And what we see on the surface of that, th that darkness that gives rise to the image, is in fact degraded cellulose. It's not a pigment. Next, the scientists looked at areas where the image displayed bleeding wounds and made a stunning discovery. The chemical signature of real blood. The team had discovered a powerful connection to the crucifixion. According to biblical accounts, Jesus was nailed to the cross. As he bled, red blood cell walls would have ruptured, releasing hemoglobin, the blood component which transfers oxygen around the body. When hemoglobin breaks down, it creates bilirubin, the substance that causes bruises to turn yellow. Analysis showed that the stains contained very high levels of bilirubin, consistent with the trauma of crucifixion. And UV photography revealed one more incredible clue. You can visually see these serum stains around the blood stains that were never visible until our team photographed the shroud with UV fluorescence photography approximately 2,000 years after this man ostensibly was, was killed. Serum is the liquid medium in which red blood cells are suspended. It remained invisible until UV light made the dried serum fluoresce. No medieval artist 
could have anticipated the invention of ultraviolet fluorescence photography and said, well, I'm going to hide this serum stain, and 700 years from now, they'll find it. Give me a break. Ray Rogers and the team finished their research in 1978 with more questions than answers. The image might have been created by contact with a real body, but whose body was it? When had he died? And was he really crucified? Crucifixion was a gruesome, drawn out and painful death, reserved for criminals and the lowest rung of Roman society. You weren't nailed up there to kill you, you were nailed up to be crucified, tortured. They didn't want you to die right away. In fact, there were evidence that they were surprised that Jesus died so soon. It's difficult to get scientific data on crucifixion because the last official Roman crucifixion happened in the year 337. But in a quiet suburb of New York City, one man's been experimenting with crucifixion for years. Forensic pathologist Dr. Frederick Zugaby has investigated many gruesome crime scenes as chief medical examiner for Rockland County, New York. My area was mechanism, manner, and cause of death, and type of suffering the individual had. Since 1948, Dr. Zugaby has been investigating the shroud to answer a fundamental question. Does the evidence on the shroud match up with a person who died by crucifixion? First, the doctor built a cross to determine how crucifixion killed people. The assumption was that the victim suffocated under the weight of his own body. But the doctor's experiments suggested otherwise. The cause of death was due to shock which causes failure of the heart as a pump. Next, he looked at how the nails were driven through the hand. The shroud shows a pool of blood near the wrists. But are human hands nailed to a cross strong enough to support a crucified body? The doctor designed special gloves to find out. His tests revealed that the nails would support the body. But he also made another startling find. The Roman practice of nailing the victim's palms to the cross would have ruptured the median nerve, turning the thumbs inwards. A careful examination of the shroud revealed exactly this. The thumbs were hidden underneath the palms, just as one would expect in a crucifixion. There are a number of other clues that the doctor's investigation found on the shroud. Looking at the face, it was not symmetrical, showing evidence of a beating. I looked at the angulations of the blood in the head region, where the crown of thorns was. The blood flows going along where the muscles will contract, and they had a corkscrew appearance. The blood shows a flow in the back of the hand, and it runs nicely along the side, and it accumulates a pool. I've seen it in many, many cases of injuries to the hand in the medical examiner's office. From his research, the doctor came to one overwhelming conclusion about the image on the shroud. From the forensic pathology point of view, it is totally consistent with a crucified individual. I have no doubts at all. Dr. Zagaby's tests and the photographic evidence matched up. The victim on the shroud had been crucified. But was it Jesus Christ or a medieval man? To answer this crucial question, scientists had to find out how old the shroud was. And that required the cooperation of the church. In 1988, scientists lobbied for permission to take a sample of cloth for carbon dating. 
I was in Rome at the time, and there was this real tension, this real controversy as to whether this should be subjected to these scientific tests. I mean, if this is the burial shroud of Jesus, is that not an indignity to what is the only physical link to the Savior? And others would say, well, look, if this is a fraud, we need to know one way or another. And the Vatican, to its credit, said, no, we're going to put this to the knife, literally. It was a historic decision. Scientists were finally given permission to carbon date the shroud. For this test, the sample would have to be burnt. Permanently destroying a piece of the shroud was a highly controversial action. The church authorities imposed strict conditions on the scientists, only allowing a small sample to be cut from a damaged corner of the shroud. It was a convenient choice. It was an inner area of a cloth that nobody was going to complain about. Nobody was going to take issue with the fact that they're pulling threads from the more pristine parts of, of the cloth. The section removed from the damaged corner was divided into four. One piece was sent to Oxford University, another to the Swiss Institute of Technology in Zurich, and two smaller pieces were sent to the University of Arizona. Dr. Tim Jowell was a member of the Arizona team. Everybody and all the plants and all the animals on the surface of this planet have approximately the same amount of carbon-14 in them as long as they're alive. When we die, the C14 in our bodies decays with a known decay rate. If we measure the carbon-14 in the sample and compare it to a standard, we can calculate the age from the ratio of the sample to the standard. First, the shroud sample was cleaned of any impurities. Then, it was burnt. We start off with a piece of linen, and we combust it at this end, turning the carbon of that sample into a gaseous state. The CO2 gas was then solidified, and the carbon was extracted. Each carbon sample was then shot through an accelerating mass spectrometer, which counted each individual carbon-14 atom. This particle detector can count one atom at a time. For a modern sample, we count upwards of 100 atoms per second. For an old sample, one that's close to 50,000 years, we may count five or 10 atoms in two minutes. By counting the number of atoms, scientists calculated the date. Finally, after checking and rechecking their results, they had the answer. We wanted to make sure we were right, so we measured it more times than we would regularly, and we knew that it wouldn't be 2,000 years old after five minutes. It turned out to be a medieval sample from the 14th century, and that's what the radiocarbon date shows. The shroud was dated between 1260 and 1390. The result was a stunning revelation making headlines around the world. The Shroud of Turin could not be the burial cloth of Jesus of Nazareth. Despite the evidence, many of the faithful refused to accept the carbon dating results. Their belief in the Shroud was unshakable. And soon they made a discovery that cast doubt on all the scientific work. By 1988, the Turin Shroud was the most controversial relic in the Christian world. But scientific tests also concluded that the image wasn't painted, and the cloth contained the chemical components of real blood. As a result, the faithful still believed that the shroud could be genuine, and the carbon dating flawed. Here you have the most studied artifact in human history, and science still can't give us an answer. Ray Rogers, a member of the team that conducted the first scientific investigation, had always kept an open mind about the shroud. But as a man of science, he was furious that the shroud believers started questioning the carbon dating evidence. I'd been reading these things by people from the lunatic fringe 
who were explaining why the date was wrong. I was irritated and just uh, getting mad. I don't have any faith at all in somebody who says, I think I see flowers on the shroud, or I think I see little sailing ships sailing along. There are people who are so emotionally involved in this that they're not going to accept any scientific result. Their faith is not going to be shaken by some pointy-headed scientist. In the remote mountains of Panama, one shroud believer's obsession was about to spark renewed interest in the shroud. Peter Soomes is a retired doctor and a 3D imaging expert who now works as an artist. The Shroud of Turin is one huge message, a gift of God to the world. While researching a sculpture, Dr. Soomes came across an image of the shroud and it changed his life. I have the feeling that that image touches the soul of people. Using his medical skills, he started a remarkable project that would bring the still image to life. I got an uh, obsessive thought in my head, because I didn't know about radiocarbon dating, I didn't know nothing. The only thing that was clear in my head was, this is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus Christ. With the help of experts in Holland and Argentina, Dr. Soons embarked on a complex process that would transform the face on the shroud into a 3D holograph. I got the idea that there was holographic information in the Shroud of Turin. The image was divided into lots of slices. Then we put these pieces all together until it formed a 3D. So what we have in the computer now is the face of Jesus Christ in three dimensions. After three years of painstaking work and computer processing, the 3D image of the body was complete. According to Dr. Soons, this is the actual face of the historical Jesus, captured just moments after death, when he was wrapped in the shroud. When I saw the results the first time, it really touched me emotionally very much. People start crying uh, spontaneously when they stand in front of uh, these images. And I've seen people, people change their life completely. It changed my life. Publication of the image ignited fresh interest in the shroud, but it didn't prove the linen cloth was genuine. Shroud believers had to embrace scientific methods if they were to have any hope of challenging the carbon dating result. And in the United States in 2000, two people did just that. Sue Benford and her husband, Joe Marino, believed the shroud was real. I never heard of the shroud before 1997. And I was flipping channels and saw the face on the TV. And um, there was something very unknowing that I had, that that was really Jesus' face. This vision inspired Benford and her husband to find proof that the carbon dating results were wrong. Neither of them were professional scientists. Benford ran a small non-profit organization advocating the humane use of animals in scientific research. And Marino worked for Ohio State University but they thought they'd found a vital clue, which proved the carbon dating was flawed. Look here. Nowhere else is there this definitive, intentional dark green. While checking images taken in 1978, Benford noticed something strange about the piece of shroud chosen for the carbon dating samples. The herringbone pattern that is so consistent elsewhere in the cloth looked misaligned. Our theory is that there is a mixture of 16th century cloth and 1st century cloth, and the data that we're finding on the cloth matches that theory. Benford and Marino believe that the carbon date was wrong because the section chosen for the samples was contaminated with later material. They believe the original linen was repaired with completely different cotton thread in the 16th century. 
The repair was then expertly dyed so that it would be invisible to the naked eye. When you do this type of wee weaving, um, you're not just stitching two pieces of material together. And that would give you all of one and all of the other. It's more like this. The ends are unraveled in the main cloth. The ends are unraveled in the patch. They are spliced together and the threads are connected and interwoven so you see literally an interweaving such that you have old and new on both sides of the equation. Well, I'm skeptical when I'm listening to this but they had taken photographs that were available of the samples taken for the carbon dating and they had submitted these to several textile experts who didn't know they were looking at a photograph from the shroud and each of these textile experts independent of each other said you know this looks rewoven the samples taken for radiocarbon dating were cut from one corner of the shroud adjacent to a seam it was effectively an area that was damaged by someone cutting a piece out of it possibly to sell as relic so it needed to be repaired Benford and Marino argued that because the carbon dating sample contained material from both the 16th and 1st centuries, the result was in between the two. Searching for definitive proof, Benford took a closer look at the carbon dating results to see if there was anything odd about the data at the three different test centers. And hidden in the numbers, she found evidence that some parts of the test sample contained more 16th century cotton. If you look at their unpublished data now, Arizona had some of the oldest dates at 1238 and the youngest at 1430. And you think, were they really 200 years off in their lab? Well, perhaps it's because of material they took from their both of their different sides. Now, we don't know that for sure and they haven't confirmed that, but that's interesting. Oxford is the next oldest and they're the, the closest to, to this side with the most main first century material. Zurich is in the middle, and guess what? They have the middle amount, and they have the middle dates. In 2000, Benford and Marino published a paper claiming that medieval cotton was introduced into the damaged corner of the linen shroud. Their claims were immediately dismissed by the scientific community one scientist in particular was outraged. One of the things Ray had a problem with was the fact these weren't scientists, and he didn't take them very seriously. I think he glumped us in with the lunatic friend at that time, and probably for many times <laughs> beyond that. I had given up on the shroud, and this was about the same time that the lunatic fringe were coming up with an infinite number of ways the date could be wrong, and this was just the last straw. I got a call from Ray, and he goes, what the hell is this? <laughs> this is nonsense. I can prove these people wrong in five minutes. And I said, well, Ray, go for it. He was the gunfighter. He was one of those guys that if he didn't like what you were saying, he'd have pulled out his six-shooter and fired off six before he had a chance to take a breath. He was not very tolerant, especially of people doing bad science. Rogers was in a unique position to confirm if the linen shroud contained later cotton repairs. Ray had in his possession from 1978, the tape samples lifted from the surface of the shroud. But remember, those were not big fibers. Those were fibrils taken from the surface. He also had some samples that were taken from the shroud by Professor Reyes, who took samples in 1973 from a corner that was immediately adjacent to the area taken for carbon dating. But Ray Rogers was in a race against time. He was fighting a losing battle with cancer, and he knew his end was near. His old friend, Barry Schwartz, was determined that Rogers should have the chance to speak from beyond the grave. I am Ray Rogers, Raymond N. Rogers, and I've been working on the Shroud since 1977. He filmed a detailed interview with Rogers so that the dying scientist could put on the record exactly what he found. 
So I read their paper and I thought, I've got the samples that can shoot that full of holes. So I got out the Ross samples and I got out the, uh, the shroud samples and I went to work again. A couple hours later, he calls me and he goes, boy, he says, I can't believe it. He says, they were right. There's cotton here. He says, there's no cotton in the rest of the shroud, but there's cotton interwoven here. They must be right. No one was more shocked than Rogers. His observations seemed to confirm Benford and Marino's theory. The original linen shroud contained additional cotton threads. To confirm this, he needed to examine the threads that were carbon dated. Until I could get a sample from the real radiocarbon cloth, a documented sample, you know, I couldn't prove anything. The carbon dating process destroyed the sample, but all the labs involved in the 1988 test kept parts of their sample in reserve. The authentic radiocarbon sample that I got, these segments of yarn were cut from the middle of the radiocarbon sample, so there was no question about them. And when I looked at these samples from the radiocarbon area, there was no problem at all finding cotton in them. Rogers was now convinced that Benford and Marino were right. And he found other evidence they had missed. He knew from his own tests in 1978 that the shroud was free of artificial dyes and pigments. And yet, when he looked at surviving threads from the carbon dating samples, that's exactly what he found. You've got photomicrographs that demonstrate this very clearly. The cotton fibers from the radiocarbon sample are fairly heavily coated with the gum dye mordant and some of the linen fibers don't show any of that at all. They look just as slick as anything and it didn't stick to them. He believed the dye was used to make the cotton repair invisible to the naked eye. If you happen to hit a place where a yarn segment from the original shroud was spliced into the new uh, reweave part, the splice, very definitely shows the new yarn that was being put in and dyed to match. The only thing in the shroud that was dyed or stained was this uh, radiocarbon area. So my hypothesis at the moment is that this was done on purpose to fool your eye. This was further evidence that the shroud was repaired with cotton in exactly the area where the carbon dating sample was taken. And when we went back and looked at the ultraviolet photographs, here is this area that's significantly darker. It doesn't fluoresce as much. And it's just this area that, uh, around the raw sample and where the radiocarbon sample was cut. And if they had looked at any of the photographs that we had and studied the information we had as of 1978, they would have known that that was the worst possible place they could have taken a sample. My conclusion is that that area was manipulated. It was done by somebody with great skill and different materials than were used to make the shroud. Here's the whole crux of it. Linen is very difficult to dye, and it ages as time goes on, so it's colored. So in order to match a reweaving with the original color, you have to use cotton and you dye the cotton. In 2005, just five weeks before losing his battle with cancer, Rogers prepared to publish his last academic paper. He wasn't casting doubt on the science of carbon dating, but the selection of a contaminated sample from the damaged corner of the shroud. In his opinion, the carbon dating tests didn't reveal its true age. But one fateful decision was about to threaten Ray Rogers' last hope of carrying out a new carbon dating test. By 2005, the scientific mainstream 
thought they'd laid the mystery of the Turin Shroud to rest, dated between 1260 and 1390. But scientist Ray Rogers had found new evidence suggesting the carbon dating sample was contaminated. I'm coming to the conclusion that it has a very good chance of being the piece of cloth that was used to bury the historic Jesus. He writes a paper that's accepted for publication in Thermochemica Acta, January of 2005. And that paper is the only peer-reviewed science that challenges the carbon date with anything credible up until that point in time. Rogers knew that his findings needed to be tested with more sophisticated equipment. So he contacted a colleague who still worked at Los Alamos Laboratory, Bob Villarreal. It was a race uh, for him because he knew he was dying. He wanted to know, is this corner of the shroud of the same composition, whether it was flax or linen or cotton? If it was cotton, it's not the same as the main shroud cloth, which is linen. Rogers would never live to discover the answer. He lost his long battle with cancer on the 8th of March, 2005. He was 78 years old. After Ray's death, Bob Villarreal was determined to honor his promise. He passed the fibers to a specialist, and something remarkable happened. I received a call from him, and he said, the thread that I was going to analyze broke into two pieces. Is God going to be mad at me? <laughs> Just as Rogers suspected, the threads appeared to be two pieces of cotton and linen woven together. In 2008, the findings were announced to the world. They supported the theory that the carbon dating sample was poorly chosen, as Rogers suggested in his final interview. They come in and they snip, 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 in secret and take the worst possible sample they could. The people who certified the sample are still trying to convince everybody that everybody else is wrong. They're right. Those were perfectly valid samples. Before he died, Rogers was a strong advocate for a new carbon dating test. Even if the age-old issue of access could be solved, there was now a much bigger problem. The methods used to preserve the delicate shroud. Back in 2002, microscopic bugs were found in the display case, so the church authorities treated the container. Ray Rogers talked about the fact that the box in which the shroud was kept, the reliquary, was treated with thymol, which is a chemical that kills anything alive, bugs, anything, bacteria. That treatment of thymol could impact future carbon dating of the cloth. By using a plant-based chemical called thymol to clean the container, they inadvertently contaminated the shroud. Introducing modern carbon atoms now made it virtually impossible to date. However, in his final interview, Rogers proposed an ingenious solution. The shroud was damaged by fire in 1532, leaving 16 burn marks where samples could be taken. And because they were pure carbon, they could be cleaned of modern impurities. You got carbon there that's been charred since 1532, and charred cloth is, is very impervious to any kind of attack. So it makes a real good dating sample. Today, the technology exists to retest the shroud, and the samples have already been taken from the cloth. In 2002, they removed the backing cloth, they removed all of these patches. You see like this charred area here? She snipped off the charred area from around these burnt holes, and they saved that. That's prime stuff. You could date that. 
If it isn't old enough to be the Shroud of Jesus, then I feel I will have witnessed a miracle because some medieval guy then will have created something that we can't even duplicate, nor can we fully explain, and I'd like to know how that was done. The Shroud of Turin is claimed to be the burial cloth of Jesus Christ. Scoffers are trying to say that it's a medieval fraud, it's a fake. But it's well documented that the Shroud existed before the Middle Ages. Here's a brief history. The Shroud was carried from the tomb of Jesus by Peter and taken to Edessa, Turkey. The Shroud was lost and wasn't rediscovered till 944 when a Byzantine emperor sent an army to bring it to Constantinople. In 1204, the European Knights of the Fourth Crusade sacked Constantinople. They took it back to France, where Margaret de Charnay transferred it to the Savoy family. In 1532, a fire in the Savoy Cathedral in Chambéry, France, damaged the shroud. And in 1578, the Savoys established their capital in Turin, Italy, and took the shroud with them, where it remains today. The first photographs of the shroud were taken by Segunda P in 1898. And he was shocked to find when he took the pictures that the negative image was a positive image. And Barry Schwartz, who is actually Jewish, he's the shroud documenting photographer, he says this, quote, Assuming that the shroud were manufactured in the 14th century, it would mean that someone would have had to conceive the concept of photography approximately 650 years before it was invented. I don't think so, end quote. Some of these scourge marks on the shroud appear only under ultraviolet light, which means that the forger would have to paint the marks so that they'd be invisible to the naked eye and then discern that ultraviolet equipment be invented some 650 years later. That's impossible. There's not a trace of paint pigment on the shroud. There are no brush strokes. The images on the shroud are directionless and therefore could not be painted, at least not by a human hand. Kevin Moran, optical engineer, says this, quote, the shroud image is made from tiny fibers that are one-tenth the size of a human hair. The picture elements are actually randomly distributed like the dots in your newspaper photograph or magazine photograph. To do this, you would need an incredibly accurate atomic laser. This technology does not exist." End quote. They also found blood on the Shroud of Turin. According to medical physicist Dr. John Heller and blood specialist Dr. Alan Adler, they found not only the markings on the Shroud were blood, but blood highly loaded with bilirubin, a bile pigment that would only show up if a dead man had been severely or traumatically beaten. And pathologist Pierre Ballon came to the further conclusion that the blood spots were human blood and of the type AB. In fact, there are 13 tests that confirmed that blood was on the shroud. The image on the shroud is negative, but the blood marks are positive. The blood marks on the shroud have remained red, and why it hasn't darkened by time and oxidation is unexplainable. At the back of the toes on the shroud, there's an original bleeding when the man was alive, and then in the tomb, there was a renewed bleeding. So two blood flows, and, and this is impossible for someone to forge. In fact, the experts were shocked by the way the blood evidence was transferred to the shroud. It was done perfectly without one smear, which practically, humanly speaking, is impossible. Dr. Max Fry was a Swiss criminologist. He was one of the leading experts in dust and pollen analysis in the whole world. In fact, he single-handedly developed a technique to determine where criminals had been by testing samples of dust and pollen from their clothing. And he was consulted on many crimes by police forces of many nations. Dr. Fry's objective was very simple. If the shroud was forged in France in the 14th century, then only the French or Italian pollens will be found in the cloth. But his exhaustive analysis found some 58 specific pollens, only 17 were native to Europe. The rest were from Palestine and southern Turkey, the site of Edessa and Constantinople. And this meant that the shroud had been in these places at some time in its history. In fact, 13 of the pollens come exclusively from Palestine and are growing in Israel today. They found on the shroud many highly accurate images of many flowers, many hundreds of these, 28 specific flowers they found to a good degree of accuracy that all these flowers, what's important about these flowers, they all grow in Jerusalem or within 12 miles of Jerusalem. So whatever produced the image on the shroud also produced a high energy field producing many images of every object that was in the shroud itself and hence we have a highly accurate image of these flowers. They've also found dirt on the footprint of the cloth and this dirt has been found to come from Jerusalem's Damascus Gate and nowhere else. And they found three-dimensional information in the Shroud of Turin. And this is incredible because we have to realize that a painting or photograph only has two-dimensional information, height and width. 
and the shroud has been found to have 3D information and they put it under a special machine called the VP8 analyzer and the VP8 analyzer found that in the shroud image there is encoded three-dimensional information which an artist could not have put there. It's also a Jewish custom when people die to put coins over the eyes uh, when laying the corpse out for burial and in the test that they did examining the shroud turn it looks like there's a coin over one of the eyes the right eye and this coin has 24 coincidences with a coin called the lepton which was put out by Pontius Pilate between 29 and 36 AD and when you look at this coin you notice the staff remember the staff and the letters UKAI and now we're going to look at the shroud reproducing it closer and closer larger and larger and under high magnification a father Phyllis found this you can see the staff and the letters UCAI and father Phyllis was shocked to see this and, but he wondered why there was a C instead of a K. But in 1981, at the British Museum, he found two coins that had a C instead of a K. So this information would throw forging completely out of the question. Father Phyllis said, quote, even the wildest imagination cannot now justify any claim that the tiny letters one thirty-second of an inch could have been printed on the cloth. Other features that proved authenticity of the shroud. The locks on the side of the face is a Jewish custom. The body on the shroud is not even straight. The abdomen appears swollen, showing that the cause of death was suffocation. The legs on the shroud are not broken, and the Romans who crucified their victims always broke the legs of the crucified. And this goes back to Exodus 12:46, where it says that they wouldn't break a bone in his body. The blood flows, we have to realize that when you're crucified, the hands fall to a 25-65 degree angle, and so the blood flows a certain way, and it's exactly the blood flows on the shroud show that it was of a man who was crucified. In fact, studying the photos of the shroud caused Dr. Pierre Barbet, chief surgeon of the St. Joseph Hospital in Paris, France, to say this, quote, if this is the work of a forger, then the forger would have to be a trained anatomist, for there is not a single blunder. Basically, you also have when a nail pierces the median nerve in the wrist, the thumb goes automatically into the palm, and that's what's shown on the shroud. And this wouldn't invalidate the prophecy, they have pierced my hands and my feet, I can count on my bones, because anatomists in all countries and throughout history have understood the hand to consist of the wrist, the palm, and the fingers. This is a picture of a Roman scourging device called the flagrum. And you'll notice it consists of a handle onto which are three leather strips that are attached. And each of these leather strips have a dumbbell-shaped object attached, metal object. And this device was used by the Romans as a means of punishing an individual by beating his body with stripes. And if you look at the size of the dumbbell-shaped object on the end of the flagrum, it fits perfectly into the wounds on the shroud. One author wrote that there are 120 scourge wounds on the Shroud of Turin, and Jewish law limited the number of lashes to 40, and 40 times 3 is 120. The wound in the side of the Shroud measures 1 and 3 fourths inches by 7 sixteenths of an inch, which exactly corresponds to the size of the tip of the Roman spear called the Lamea. It's also called the Spear of Longinus, and it's kept in the Habsburg Treasure House in Vienna, Austria, and legend has it that this is the spear that pierced the side of Jesus, and it was owned by Longinus, a Roman soldier assigned to duty at the crucifixion site by Pontius Pilate. Now, what's interesting is uh, that Hitler believed this legend, and he visited the Habsburg Treasure House when he was 19. When he invaded Austria at the very beginning of World War II, he took the spear because he believed that he had to have the spear to go out and conquer the world. Forensic pathologist from Los Angeles County, Dr. Robert Buckland, finishes his analysis of the shroud by saying, quote, the evidence of a scourge man who was crucified and died of suffocation is clear cut. The markings on this body are so clear and so medically accurate that they are, in my opinion, beyond dispute. And the other question is, why would anyone keep this kind of relic, so gruesome a relic, unless it was the true burial cloth of Jesus Christ? Details of a crime scene are not released to the public. And there's a reason for that. Sometimes a person who committed a crime or a brutal murder will like to brag about it. They might be at a bar talking to someone and will accidentally disclose a detail of the crime scene.
that was not released to the public, that person comes to the police and says, hey, I know who did it. And they bring that person in for questioning. And they know they have a credible witness when the witness can disclose details of the crime that were not released to the public that only someone at the crime scene could possibly know. The Shroud of Turin is such a witness, a credible witness that knows details of a crime scene that happened to this man right here, and this person of interest that we're looking at, we believe to be Jesus of Nazareth, because the forensic evidence and the gospel account match up more than extremely well. This is the dead on match. And then the Shroud of Turin expands upon, elaborates upon the Gospel account and gives us extreme details. Again, very important point. Sometimes false information is released about the crime scene. When a suspect is being questioned, interrogated, if they can correct the errors, they know they have a credible witness. This is another way we can be certain of something beyond a reasonable doubt. In the Shroud of Turin, we see this continually throughout the image, starting with the nail wound going through the wrist, not in the palm of the hand. It corrects the errors of hundreds of paintings, false information released to the public. Note also that the abdominal area is slightly swelled and discolored. That is the first of seven stages of putrefaction, of decomposition. It tells you that the body, the shroud witness, is telling us this body has been dead for 48 to 72 hours. So at the time the image was formed, the man in the shroud had been dead for two to three days. More false info released to the public is that the nail wound goes in the front of the foot when the nail wound actually goes through the side of the foot, through the heel. Shroud witness corrects that error. Credible witness, again. Shroud of Turin knows details of the crime scene that only someone who was at the crime scene could possibly know. The Shroud knows the names of several different plants growing around the area where the crime took place. The Shroud knows the name of a rare calcite on the heel area the man in the shroud also observed on the knees and on the tip of the nose. This rare calcite made contact with the heels, with the knees and the tip of the nose and it can only be found around in an area around the Damascus Gate. Near Golgotha, near the Garden Tomb, the, the Damascus Gate is the main entrance to the city. So that places the man in the shroud at the scene of the crime. Beyond a reasonable doubt, he was there. He was there. He was there. Shroud knows exactly how many scourge wounds were applied and where they made contact with the body. And the plowers plowed on my back, they made their furrows long. I gave my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. Forensic evidence matches scripture. Again, the rare calcite on the heel area. Knows that the man on the shroud was scourged by two people. One was taller than the other. Knows which parts of his face were struck while being questioned. While, while being questioned by the high priest, Jesus was struck in the face. The right side was struck more than the left. Knows that the right eye was swollen shut as a result. Knows exactly which part of the beard was plucked out. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. The middle section and parts of the right and left side of the beard were plucked out. Shroud tells us that his nose was abraded slash dislocated, likely due to, to violent contact with the soil outside the Damascus Gate. Noah's one of his feet made a complete impression on the linen, meaning that Jesus was buried with his knees raised in a state of rigor mortis. Bear in mind again, the nail wound goes into the side of the heel, not into the front of the foot. That was false information released to the public. Shroud witness corrects the air knows that when a nail is driven into the wrist, the thumb moves inward as a result. The shroud is a witness coming forward saying, hey, I know who this person is. It knows the width of a, the spear that made the side wound. 
It matches the dimensions of a first century Roman hosta. And of course, we're looking at the side wound, and the side wound has postmortem blood. The blood tested positive for human albumin, blood tested positive for hemoglobin, blood tested positive for elevated levels of bilirubin. There are serum contraction rings around that postmortem wound. There are serum contraction rings around all the blood stains on the shroud of turn, which are nearly 400. Alrighty then, no, there are serum contraction rings around the blood stains. McFly, think about that. That means it's genuine. I mean, we can reconstruct the exact type of flagrum used to create the scourge wounds on the man in the shroud. It is consistent with a first century Roman flagrum. Shroud knows how tall Jesus was. Approximately 5'11", 175 pounds. Knows Jesus had long hair. Knows exactly how long it was. Knows that it was tied, put in a ponytail at the burial. That's not the gospel account. That's information not released to the public. Knows Jesus was buried nude. It says in the scripture, from a clothing that cast lots. It doesn't say that he was buried nude, but it implies it. The Shroud of Turin clarifies. It expands upon the gospel account and gives us details of the crime scene that only someone who is at the crime scene could possibly know. It knows that the blood from the side wound is going to flow down vertically and then change direction and flow horizontally, horizontally across the lower back. Only someone who is at the crime scene could possibly know that. Shroud witness knows that. Knows that as a result of carrying a heavy object, on his back, it will leave abrasion and compression marks. And we can, we can see exactly, we can see those compression marks on the shoulders. Notice one shoulder will be higher than the other as a result of one of the shoulders being dislocated. Notice that the exact angle, the exact angles and position of the arms of Jesus well when he died on the cross. Knows a plain weave white linen was not used in the burial as normally would be used. Knows a fine linen cloth was used. Fine linen cloth purchased by Joseph of Arimathea. That's what it says in the scripture, a fine linen. And it tells us, the shroud witness tells us exactly how long it is. It's eight by two cubits. It's a philateric cubit, a first century measuring system. The shroud witness tells us the linen cloth was a three over one herringbone twill that was in existence in ancient times in Egypt and Syria, but not in a medieval time. It tells us, the shroud tells us, the stitching pattern where they sewed in the three inch strip along the left side, 14 feet long, is a first century style. Stitching that matches linens found in Masada, next to the Dead Sea. The shroud also tells us what's not on the cloth, which is a absence of a substance called vanillin which tells us that the shroud is minimum 1,300 years old. Recent tests of stress on the fabric prove that the cloth is ancient and comes from the time of Jesus. I'm gonna quote Dr. Max Fry, who did a pollen study on the shroud starting in 1973. I can affirm without fear of being proven wrong, this cloth dates back to Palestine 2,000 years ago. And with that, we're going to look at the pollen evidence. This is the history of the shroud according to the forensic evidence, the pollen evidence, and it matches the historical record. It begins at the Dead Sea, and then the pollen trail goes to Jerusalem, and then it goes north. The pollen trail goes north through Syria and Lebanon into Edessa, Turkey. Then in the year 912, According to the historical record, it was brought to Constantinople. Okay, the pollen evidence goes all the way, nine different plants in Turkey, from one side of Turkey to the other. And then in 1204, the shroud is stolen by French crusaders. It goes through Romania and Hungary, and then across the Swiss Alps into France. And for a brief period of time, the shroud was in the open air in Spain and then back into France in the 14th century. And then 
The Savoy family purchases the Shroud of Turin, so it winds up in Turin, Italy. At one point, the Shroud was taken into Rome, and there are pollens from Rome on the Shroud, and then back to Turin. But the historical record and the forensic evidence are in agreement. On a side note, the Shroud of Turin was in the open air in a city 150 miles south of Constantinople called Troas. Paul of Tarsus makes mention of it, of a cloak that he left there. And then it goes across the sea into Greece. There are pollens from Greece on the shroud. It was there briefly, there's only one, a pollen from one plant. And then it either went back to Troas and back to Constantinople, or the other possibility is the Templar Knights brought it into Greece. So either Paul of Tarsus had it there, or the Templar Knights. Take your pick. On a closing note on the pollen evidence, some of it was too old and degraded to be identifiable. But of course, if these were medieval pollens from 500 years ago, they would easily be identifiable. Point is, the pollens on the shroud are ancient. Here are the details of the crime scene. Do you want to know exactly what happened to Jesus? Because we'll tell you everything that happened to this man in extreme detail. Shroud, nose, myrrh, and aloes were used on the body. Myrrh and aloes were found in the blood by antibody antigen testing by Dr. Baima Ballon. These same myrrh and aloes were also found on the headcloth in Spain. So the Shroud of Turin is a witness, and in the Bible, when whatever Jesus did, all the miracles that Jesus did, there's always two to three witnesses. So who is the witness to the resurrection? Who are the witnesses? There's always a witness. The witness is the Shroud of Turn, the Sudarium of Oviedo, and the third witness would be the empty tomb. We could add Mary Magdalene. Expensive linen and myrrh and aloes is used on what looks like the most hated person in the city. That's out of place. That's like a gold ring in a pig's snout. It only fits in one historical case. Jesus of Nazareth. First century, ancient cloth, first century cloth, eight by two cubits. I mean, all the pieces of the puzzle are here, because if you want to put them together. Shroud witness tells us a cap of thorns was used, not a crown. It corrects the air, the false information given to the public. Notice how many drops of blood will make contact with the cloth during the burial in the non-image areas, which there are over a hundred on the right side. And a series of these drops come a short distance from where the cap of thorns was as if when the cap of thorns was removed it left blood drops in the cloth the legs are not broke the shroud witness tells us that the man in the shroud his legs weren't broke matches the gospel account and when they came to jesus they saw that he was dead already so they so they did not break his legs but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced the side and out came out blood and water but the sequence of events the man in the shroud is beaten mocked scourged Beard plucked out, crucified, side pierced, legs not broke, wrapped in the shroud in the fine linen, and the body left the shroud before decomposition set in. And as a result, formed an image, and this image was formed 48 to 72 hours after death. I mean, who does that sound like? Who would that be? Beyond a reasonable doubt, beyond a reasonable doubt, the man in the shroud is Jesus. We have so many different numerical match points in this case that it is actually superior to DNA evidence. The calculated odds of probability and chance that another person underwent this sequence of events, beaten, part of the beard plucked out, mocked with a crown of thorns, scourged and crucified, right side pierced, legs not broke, wrapped in a fine expensive linen with myrrh and owls, and then the body was removed from the cloth before decomposition set in and left a 3D image behind. One in 282 billion chance. All right, we're gonna note similarities between the Shroud of Turin and the Sudarium of Oviedo. The first one, 
are the blood stain patterns are very similar. On the back of the head of the Shroud of Turin is a blood stain that looks like a number three. And then you go to the Sudarium of Oviedo and lo and behold, you have the same type of blood pattern that takes on the shape, a numerical shape, of the number three. Now, what's significant is that the blood is type AB blood on the Sudarium of Oviedo same blood that's on the shroud. Same blood, same pollen, same rare calcite, myrinals on the cloth, pulmonary edema fluid on the cloth. I mean, the cloth was authenticated as the property of Jesus in the 11th century by the Spanish government. 120 points of facial recognition, points of congruency, 70 points that match in the front, 50 points that match on the back. 120. Beyond any reasonable doubt, the person whose head that made contact with Sudarium of Oviedo is the same person whose head made contact with the Shroud of Turin. The calcite, the rare calcite from the Damascus Gate that's on the tip of the nose of the Shroud of Turin is also on the Sudarium. All right, so the person whose head made contact with the Sudarium, also the tip of his nose also made violent contact with the ground outside the Damascus Gate. I mean, at some point you gotta wave the white flag. The Sudarium is a known item of Jesus, so we're comparing it to the Shroud in the same way you would get the dental records of someone to compare with their remains to make a positive ID. You know, somebody please direct me to where in the historical record another person had a gondalia torn a 40 plant put on their head. Somebody besides Jesus of Nazareth, because that's the only person in history that's ever been mocked and crucified as a king. And those pollens are on the Sudarium of Oviedo. You know, it's not there by random coincidence. There are 120 points of facial recognition between the sidereum and the shroud that match. Points of congruency. That is better than dental records. That is a positive ID beyond any reasonable doubt. The man whose head made contact with the sidereum is the same man whose head made contact with the shroud of Turin. <laughs>